Good evening. My name is Peter Christian Agner. I am the director of the Gotham Center for New York City History, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. If it is your first time with the Gotham Center, as always, I invite you to learn more about us online at gothamcenter.org, where you can find nearly a thousand articles, hundreds of podcasts, event recordings, dozens of book talks, digital exhibits, and more on all things New York City history. Those of you looking for a deeper dive can also check out our online education program for adults, Gotham Ed. You can find those mini courses at gothamed.com. Tonight, as part of our regular series featuring some of the best and most interesting new work on New York City history, we'll be discussing Vincent Kiernan's new book, Atomic Bill, A Journalist's Dangerous Ambition in the Shadow of the Bomb, released by Three Hills Cornell University Press last November. William Lawrence, the subject of this biography, is not perhaps a well-known name today, but he is a familiar, very familiar figure to students of the dawn of the nuclear age and was very famous in the early Cold War, known as perhaps the leading science reporter, definitely the leading, I'm sorry, known as the leading science reporter on the all-important question of nuclear weapons. During the late 1930s and into the Second World War, physicists raced to see who could unlock this new frontier of energy racked by the fear that Hitler would be the first to weaponize the power. Lawrence, a staff writer at the New York Times, was the only journalist, journalist granted access to the Manhattan Project, where he spent months drawing up the first reportage on the bomb detonated in Los Alamos and used shortly afterward on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. As our guest tonight will explain in a moment, it was a corrupt relationship from the start, which would extend well into the 1950s as the Pentagon moved on to develop bombs that could deliver 500 times the destruction unleashed on Japan. As the public moved haltingly from jubilation at the end of the Pacific War to the gradual realization that governments were now racing to develop weapons that could destroy most, most of humanity in a nuclear exchange, Lawrence served as the pioneer of a group of journalists who delivered that information, often in misleading fashion. He gathered two Pulitzer Prizes from Columbia's prestigious School of Journalism before a far more local scandal ended his story with the paper of record. But his story is very much a New York tale and one that should be regarded as a cautionary tale in our time. When atomic, the atomic scientists who monitor the doomsday clock warn us that we have never stood closer to this existential threat. I won't say any more, but on that happy note, Allow me to briefly introduce our guest this evening, who will start us off with a presentation before we have conversation and then turn things over to you in Q&A. Vincent Kiernan is the Dean of the School of Professional Studies at Catholic University in Washington, DC. Previously, he served as an Associate Dean at George Mason University and at Georgetown University's School of Continuing Studies, where he led the university's undergraduate program for working students. He earned a PhD in communications from the University of Maryland, College Park, an executive master's in leadership from Georgetown's McDonough School of Business, and a master of science in adult education from Kansas State University. Prior to his academic career, Dr. Kiernan also spent more than 20 years as a science and medical journalist, which has been the focus of his scholarship. His first book, Embargoed Science, attacks the popular notion of lone scientists toiling for years until they strike upon great discoveries announced to the world, uh, announced to the world as romanticized fiction. In reality, Kiernan argues an elite few scholarly journals control press coverage through embargoes on information, distributing advanced copies of the research to hundreds, sometimes thousands of journalists around the world on the condition that reporters agree not to report their story until the journals publish. This practice of collusion structures public knowledge of science and medicine, he argues, fostering what he calls pack journalism, an unhealthy shield against competition, which he maintains produces uncritical reporting according to the dictates of a few key sources. I'm gonna turn things over to Vincent now. One bit of housekeeping, the chat feature as always is disabled out of respect to our guests. So I will ask you to use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to send us questions. You can do that at any point in the next hour. Uh, we will begin answering your questions at 7.30. So with that, I will turn things over to Vincent now, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming our guests with some silent applause. Well, thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. 
perhaps appropriately in a time of such deep cultural and political polarization here in the United States, William Leonard Lawrence remains a polarizing figure almost a half century after his death. As the New York Times who went behind the scenes to report the first use of the atomic bomb, he has attracted diverse opinions. Many, including many journalists and apparently the top editors of the New York Times even today, continue to regard him as an example of Particularly those opposed to atomic weapons tend to see him as a deplorable propagandist for the bomb. I set forth in my book a third perspective on Lawrence, that he was a dishonest, unethical publicity seeker who leveraged the atom bomb and his position at the Times to build his own brand for his own benefit while ignoring his journalistic responsibilities. I've got a picture here of Lawrence. So let me put him, put him up so you can gaze on him in his glory. Here he is. Certainly Lawrence does have many items to his credit in his life. A Lithuanian immigrant who arrived in New York without his parents in 1905 at age 17, he largely taught himself English and found ways to support himself. After moving to Boston, he attended an evening high school and eventually enrolled in Harvard University, where he was today what we would call a non-traditional undergraduate student, older than his peers, working to support himself. He struggled academically, and deplorably, he, he encountered blatant anti-Semitism among Harvard deans. He got this close to graduating, but was derailed by unpaid debts. Again, a common tale of woe among non-traditional and even some traditional undergraduate students even today. Think about the, the debt forgiveness controversy that we have right now. So Lawrence took a break from college to serve in the US Army Signal Corps in France at the end of World War I. And on his return to Cambridge, he helped someone he had tutored attempt to impersonate another student taking an exam at Harvard. This was so serious an offense to Harvard that despite persistent hounding by Lawrence over the decades, even after he received his Pulitzer Prizes, Harvard never granted him his degree. Throughout his life, Lawrence frequently would evade this fact or would outright lie about holding a Harvard degree. Later, after finally graduating from nearby Boston University with a bachelor's degree in law, he moved to New York and tried his hand in journalism at the New York World, one of Joseph Pulitzer's newspapers. And he was hired away from the, by the New York Times after writing a fawning story about a researcher who had who claimed to have debunked Einstein's theory of relativity. And Lawrence became what the New York Times would claim to be the first full-time science news reporter. His stories consistently had high drama. Whatever discovery he was writing about was the biggest, the best, the most important. And as a result, they frequently ran on the front page, drawing attention to the Times and Lawrence. Usually, history would prove that Lawrence's upbeat description of whatever scientific news he was covering was mostly hype. He arrived in journalism at a time when scientists were plumbing the basic secrets of the atom, its structure, how it worked. A subject that riveted Lawrence and played to his abilities to hype stories. At the same time, a group of pioneering science journalists was emerging at various newspapers and news agencies in the United States. They would see each other at scientific conferences and events. And as a group, they began to exhibit pack journalism, collectively covering the same stories in a uniform way, long before that phenomenon even got its name. And long before the journal embargo, which our uh, moderator mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. Lawrence covered many different stories about science, but he maintained a singular fascination with the atom. Through the 1930s, he became more and more convinced 
that the atom might be a source of almost unimaginable energy that could be harvested for the benefit of humanity, but that also could be channeled into military purposes. As the threat of the Nazis grew, so did Lawrence's alarm about what German physicists might be secretly doing in their own laboratories while American researchers seemed to be asleep at the switch. By May 1940, his concerns reached the point that he sought to play Paul Revere with a front page Sunday story that trumpeted the emerging potential of uranium and the Nazis' research on it. Lawrence was perplexed and upset to see very little reaction to his newspaper story. What he didn't know was that secretly American physicists were indeed furiously working on the question of atomic power. And both they and government officials were lying low to avoid giving Lawrence's claims any credence. In fact, military intelligence tracked questions about Lawrence's article and reporting and his reporting even appears to have hit, tipped off the Soviet Union to the importance of uranium. Soon enough, soon enough, Lawrence's vindication came along with an opportunity to boost his career. By 1945, the Manhattan Project was nearing secret, was nearing secret success in its mission to produce the first atomic bomb. And its director, Army General Leslie Groves, shown in this picture on the right-hand side, convinced the Times editors to lend Lawrence to the project to produce the press releases that the government would distribute when the bomb was first used in war. Here, this picture is Groves and Lawrence after the war. In his assignment, Lawrence crisscrossed the country visiting secret testing sites and interviewing scientists and engineers for the press releases he was writing for the government. But he was also accumulating expertise for his post-war work. Clearly, he had books and other journalistic projects in mind. He was on hand. Well, here, here's Lawrence at Los Alamos, for example. He was on hand in the New Mexico desert on July 16, 1945, for the test detonation of a plutonium-fueled nuclear weapon called Trinity, the first nuclear explosion. But Lawrence also provided cover for Trinity by writing a disinformation press release distributed by the army that claimed the huge blast in the pre-dawn hours was only a garden variety accident. He wrote other versions of the uh, press release that would have been distributed had people died, including himself. After Trinity, he hoofed it to the Pacific island of Tinian, which was the launching base for the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Here he is posing with a press officer before the Hiroshima flight took off. Here's a gathering of everyone just before the flight took off. Lawrence didn't get to fly to Hiroshima, but he did get to fly on the Nagasaki mission, not in the bombing plane, but in one of the chase planes. In fact, this is the plane that he flew on, the Great Artiste. And this is the Nagasaki explosion that Lawrence witnessed. He was wearing welder's glasses, so I'm not sure that he saw the, the blast in this way. His release is on Hiroshima, used by newspapers across the country, and his reporting on the Manhattan Project, after he returned stateside, firmly established him as the leading reporter on atomic weaponry. So this is the Times coverage 
which of course Lawrence didn't write because he was in, he was on Tinian at the time. But his paper, like every other paper in the country, got the press releases that were distributed at the Pentagon after the Hiroshima bombing. And the Times was not lazy about leveraging Lawrence for their own benefit. Here, for example, is a newspaper truck. And you can see on the side, read the eyewitness story of the atom atomic bomb by William L. Lawrence. So Lawrence stayed in Tinian for only a few days after the bombing, came back to the States, and about a month later, wrote a series of eyewitness accounts about, about uh, Trinity, about Nagasaki, and about everything that he had seen while traveling the country for the Manhattan Project. And it's that series of articles that earned him his second Pulitzer Prize. For the following two decades, Lawrence coasted on the reputation that he got out of his atomic bomb work. He wrote books and magazine articles. He appeared on the radio and television, he gave speeches. He appeared in civil defense educational films that sought to teach citizens to avoid the worst of an atomic bomb by shielding themselves from its bright blast. He even was cast to appear on a live variety television show celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Ford Motor Company. But he was such a poor performer in a routine about atomic power that he was cut at the last minute, even though that made the show run short. They'd rather have the show be short than have Lawrence on it. Through all of this, much was happening in the government's atomic weapons programs. New designs, new issues, the question of the hydrogen bomb. Lawrence was absent from all these stories. Instead, on the lecture circuit, leveraging his fame as the reporter who went inside the Manhattan Project. And indeed, the Manhattan Project had not been the first time that Lawrence took orders from the government. Earlier during the war, Lawrence and some other reporters, with the permissions of their editors, worked for the Army Surgeon General, writing press releases about developments in military medicine that were intended to raise the morale of families back home worried about troops deployed overseas. And Lawrence plagiarized. After World War II, the government det detonated the first of, first two rather, of many atomic tests in the South Pacific. And Lawrence and many other reporters were on hand to watch this time. For example, here's a picture of Lawrence with a couple of government officials in at the series of first two tests in the South Pacific called Operation Crossroads. The other reporters all wrote lengthy stories, but at least twice, Lawrence plagiarized government press releases. He would write a short introduction and then append the entire text of the press release verbatim as if it was his own stories. That's how it appeared to readers in the Times. They couldn't tell that it was plagiarized, but other reporters in the South Pacific well knew what Lawrence had done because they could all see each other's work. Meanwhile, Lawrence was spending many hours schmoozing with and coaching the other journalists, holding forth on what he knew about atomic weapons to once again, build his brand. Here's another picture of Crossroads. You can see, if you look closely, you'll see on the water, you'll see uh, ships. One of the, cro the Crossroads tests, one of its purposes was to see how effective atomic bombs would be against naval vessels. This is not Crossroads. This is a hydrogen bomb test in 1956.
Lawrence, Lawrence got into in covering the hydrogen bomb testing. He covered for the government, he covered for the government when another atomic test in the South Pacific spewed a vast cloud of deadly radiation, killing Japanese fishermen. And after that, evidence accumulated that the test had involved a new weapon design intended to produce toxic fallout on purpose. For years, Lawrence denied this, apparently at the behest of his friend, Louis Strauss, the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. And in 1956, he was one of a handful of journalists invited back to the South Pacific to cover this test, the first drop of a hydrogen bomb from a plane. Lawrence filed a story claiming it was the largest explosion ever. It wasn't, not by a long shot. But the Times Prestige created pressure back home on other journalists there to say the same thing. Even the admiral in charge of the test contradicted Lawrence to his face, saying it was not as powerful as Lawrence had claimed in his article. Finally, Lawrence tried to get the Times by long distance to revise the story, but the presses had already started running and the Times was unwilling to stop them. And here's that story. And you'll see the, the third paragraph down, this ran on page one, personal observations of atomic explosions in comparisons with data in tests of former hydrogen fusion devices strongly suggest that the explosion this morning was by far the most stupendous release of explosive energy on earth so far, dwarfing all previous hydrogen fusion explosions by the United States and by indications, all similar tests held in the Soviet Union. Again, everything Lawrence wrote about had to be the biggest, the most important, the most notable. After this incident, top management at the Times finally began to realize that they had a problem with Lawrence. It's not to say they had not crossed swords with Lawrence before. He was, he was a challenging person to manage, but this incident really began to make them realize that something was awry. And they became so tired of Lawrence's antics that they moved him from news reporting to writing editorials. As anybody who has tried to deal with a problem employee by moving them to another position might predict, this didn't work so well. In fact, it was a phenomenally bad idea and it eventually led to his forced retirement. Lawrence, as we see, was, was always a sycophant to those in power. He had become friends with Robert Moses, a name I'm sure familiar to everybody on this call, the master builder of New York City. Moses, among the many things he was doing, at this point, Moses was leading the upcoming New York World's Fair and he drew Lawrence into promotion of that event. Both should have realized that it was improper for Lawrence to be promoting the World's Fair, given its importance, given its use of public money, given its, its own um, controversialness. But he put Lawrence under contract while he was still employed at the Times and had Lawrence write letters lobbying the Eisenhower and Kennedy administrations about federal participation in the fair. He paid Lawrence to chair a committee to write a lavish proposal for federal participation. And Lawrence and his wife joined a tour of world capitals paid for by the fair to promote other countries' involvement in the fair. But most egregiously from a journalistic point of view, in April, 1963, when the Times editorial page director was out of town, Lawrence managed to slip into the paper an editorial endorsing government money for a permanent science center at the fair. Lawrence even passed Moses a pre-publication copy of the editorial and then publicly testified without his management's position on behalf of the money before an appropriating body of the city government, the Board of Estimate. After the editorial page director returned to town and discovered what had happened, the publisher forced Lawrence to retire. 
For the rest of the fair's run, Lawrence worked for Moses as a PR specialist before retiring with his wife to Majorca, Spain, where he died of heart trouble in 1977. So why is Lawrence so problematic? He craved his own fame and the money that he thought should come with it more than serving the public good. He was constantly hyping stories, not just on the atom bomb, but on every other topic, such as cancer cures, to try to show that he was smarter than the scientific establishment, but he wasn't. He wanted to be a player on the public stage, but he never pulled that off. The bottom line is that although Lawrence was working at a prestigious journalistic organization, he never really saw himself as a journalist. Rather, he saw himself as a science communicator, a link in a communications chain from scientists to the public that would produce the acceptance and adoption of scientific ideas and findings. He wanted to tell people what scientists had accomplished or discovered, but he showed little interest in bringing journalistic scrutiny to how well they were doing it, whether they were benefiting society or whether their relationship with the government served the public interest. This was true of his attitudes toward all science and technology, not just atomic weaponry, and it affected all his reporting and writing. Again and again, he took direction from the government and from powerful people like Robert Moses and Louis Strauss on what to write and report. He went so far as to put his byline atop government press releases. He promoted the government line that radiation from atomic detonations was of little concern. Moreover, Lawrence naively saw science as an unalloyed force for good. He wrote in 1958, I believe that science not only will serve humanity, but it will save humanity. In 1962, as the United States was getting ready to send a probe to the moon and John Glenn into Earth orbit, Lawrence encouraged an audience at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia to be optimistic about science. He said, as long as we have a free society in which the human intellect can operate at its best. We will come out on top, victorious, triumphant, and full of hope for a better and finer future. In other words, Lawrence was a cheerleader for science, not a disinterested journalistic observer of science. Cheerleaders in the media pushing a specific viewpoint are a bad idea. You and I should be able to trust that those who work in the media are serving only the interests of the public, of readers, viewers, listeners, and their interest alone. They should not be serving the interests of the government or the powerful or the scientific establishment as Lawrence frequently did. Thank you, Vince. Um, I want to say congratulations on your book. Um, I enjoyed it very much. You thoroughly researched this subject. That is very obvious. Um, and I have lots of questions. Um, I want to encourage everybody at this point, if you have questions, to send those questions in with the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Um, but let's start off in the beginning. Um, uh, his early life, you, you mentioned his background coming over from, from Lithuania, um, uh, his time at Harvard. Um, he works for a time for the, uh, the world created by Joseph Pulitzer, which is a rather sensationalist, sort of pioneer of sensational journalism, um, has a uh, sort of uh, what a speckled career in World War II. Um, I'm curious about how much you think some of those elements shape his his personality, his beliefs, his politics. Um, I, I, I think there's probably an obvious connection here with him being a Lithuanian Jew in the context of World War II and the Holocaust and the race to try to beat Hitler to the atomic bomb. How much are these things factoring into his personality? Because you paint a picture of a guy who was uh, you know, you, you, I wondered constantly through the book whether there was a core here or he was just kind of uh, always out to create a career. Um, how much how much do you think these sort of markers of his identity and his experience shape some sense of 
consist uh, genuine belief ethics. So I think the two aspects of Lawrence that you mentioned um, are actually two sides of the same coin. Um, what did he stand for? He stood for himself um, because he had learned to be a survivor. Uh, he had learned he had learned to do what he needed to do to survive for himself. Um, he, um, for example, when he left Lithuania, he had to be smuggled out. He was smuggled out in a pickle barrel um, because because it was so difficult to leave Lithuania in those days. Um, and then he arrived in the United States without any family, without anybody to take care of him. He had to, he had to, he was completely on his own. And, um, you know, I gave a very brief summary of what it was that he did, but he really did. He taught himself English. He got into Harvard, uh, which is not quite as difficult as it would be today, but still was not nothing. Um, he had, so he learned, I think at an early age that he had to, he was in charge of himself. He, had, he couldn't rely on anybody else. He was back in Lithuania. He had been in terrible conflict with his father. Um, so one has to assume there were, there were some parental issues there or, or you know, a sense of abandonment from his father that uh, also amplified that. He was very close to his mother but not so much for his father. His father was deeply Orthodox and had religious plans for Lawrence, which Lawrence rejected. Lawrence was much more interested in secular things. So he was on his own. Um, and I think we see that throughout his career. He's constantly, as a journalist, for example, as he's constantly building his brand. He doesn't trust the times. You can, you can see in his in letters and things that he writes, he never feels that he's being paid enough. He never feels that he's getting the respect that he wants, that he deserves, even after he's gotten his Pulitzer Prize and his second Pulitzer Prize. Now, it, it's also possible that he wasn't, that the Times was um, not giving him as much as they might have. I'm not saying that, not saying there wasn't some, some truth there, but It never would have been enough for him. And, and he turned to things, he did things that were clearly wrong. If, if I were his boss with some of the things that I'd already done, he'd have been fired much yeah. sooner. Well, this, this segues into another question I had, which was, um, you know, you make a big point and an important point, I think, early on in the book that um, uh, it's not as if, you know, today the media landscape is exactly one that boasts uh, uh, great job security, but um, uh, this is a time when, despite the, the sort of enormous size of journalism um, uh, as an industry, um, most journalists are rather in an unstable position. Journalism is a sort of blue collar job, um, rather sort of unsteady. Um, how important is that to his story and maybe sort of the wider pack journalism you're talking about at this time? I think the way that Lawrence developed job security was through his hype. He was constantly able to get stories on the front page. Um, so communication scholars, one of the things that we talk about is the kinds of effects the media has. And one form of effect is what's called the agenda setting effect. In other words, um, there are times that the media doesn't convince us what to think, but they convince us what to think about. So you and I might have different opinions about the war in Gaza right now. But we're both thinking about the war in Gaza. And a, a key reason why is probably because it's in the in the media all the time. This is an important story. People are thinking about it. The president is saying things about it. The Democrats are saying the Republicans. So it's on our agenda of things to think about. Lawrence was great at setting the agenda of other science journalists. Um, he, um, for example, he decided at one point, uh, a couple of years before the World War II, he decided he came across a physicist who he thought the scientific establishment was being nasty to, probably out of anti-Semitism, a guy named Felix Ehrenhaft. This, this, uh, this physicist had a theory that magnetism flows like electricity. Um, if that were true, we would be plugging our 
TVs into and our computers into wall sockets of, of magnetism. He was wrong. But Lawrence thought that the scientific establishment was not giving him a fair shake. And he decided to publicize what this guy was doing, publicize his research. And he hyped it no end. And it got to the point that after he wrote several front page stories about Aaron Half's work, other journalists just had to, they had to join in. He set their agendas. Um, and so for about a year, year and a half, Lawrence created a boomlet in news coverage about this guy that probably ended only because the Manhattan Project came along and Lawrence had to go and work on that and didn't have time to futz around with magnetism anymore. But it's, it, that's, a, that's a, um, a sign of the power that he had with these other journalists. There was a small core of science journalists that were working together and Lawrence very much set their agenda yeah, much of the time. And that allowed him to keep his job. Well, this um, makes me think of a, another question that's sort of related. Um, we already have people asking um, whether he knew Robert Oppenheimer. Let's save that for later. But um, the the other element of the story that's there is uh, the way in which the military and government's interest in this subject also is a sort of corrupting effect on scientists, right? We've all sort of, you know, I'm assuming most of the people in this uh, uh event have either seen the movie or know the the Oppenheimer story. Um, uh, they know, for example, that they're, what I mean is that uh, he, like many other scientists, become quite remorseful or um, opposed to the weaponization of, of their research. How much is this story about the corruption that goes beyond journalism, but to the scientific community too? Well, Lawrence, Lawrence's primary information base were the scientists. Um, first off, he naturally uh, gravitated to scientists. And secondly, the time that he spent uh, in the Manhattan Project, in which where he did, among other things, uh, meet Oppenheimer. He actually knew Oppenheimer before the Manhattan Project. But so that's his reference group were scientists. Um, it actually became a problem for him as a journalist not just because he was, his attitudes were being shaped by the scientists, but he also didn't have information from the military people. So after, after the initial bombs were dropped, um, you know, it passed out. The atom bomb project became much more influenced by the military operation than the scientists. There were, there were, as I mentioned earlier, there were developments. There were technical developments, there were political developments, and Lawrence didn't have sources in that. Um, and that meant when news, when things were, were news, when news stories needed to be written, Lawrence was in no place to do it. Lawrence ended up going to bomb explosions and writing this essentially the same story over again and again and again. Oh my God, what an amazing bomb. It was the biggest ever. Uh, how important is this? He didn't really follow the um, the technical details of what was going on. So he wasn't giving the public informed commentary about what was going on with their tax dollars and their national security and their health and safety with the design and development of new atomic weapons with radiation problems, all that sort of stuff, because he was so hooked into the scientists. He was so dominated by them. Um, you have a, so he's the only scientist who's allowed, uh, or I'm sorry, journalist who's allowed to the Manhattan Project and, and becomes uh, the major source for a lot of the early reportage on, on what happens in um, Los Alamos in Japan. Um, uh, yet in the, you know, in the, the aftermath of this, when it starts to sink in uh, what this weapon means. Um, you know, it's not until the very end of the Cold War, the scientists kind of figure out that a nuclear exchange could uh, quite possibly kill all life on the planet. Um, yes. um, but um, the military knows quite early on that it, that it can be 
hugely devastating. Um, uh, folks who might be familiar with uh, Blade Daniel Ellsberg know that in his last book, he, he talks about um, this was part of the real goal he had with the Pentagon Papers. And he was sort of shocked out of his early career as a nuclear scientist, one of one of the sort of Henry Kissinger types of the 50s, when he came into the JFK administration and learned that the plans for first strike would have involved essentially destroying a third of all living beings on the planet. Um, there is this moment at the end of the war in the, in the late 40s where we see this big movement for things like a much stronger uh, uh, UN to police things like nuclear weapons. Um, and you know that he's speaking to some of these groups and uh, sounds a bit like an abolitionist, a nuclear abolitionist, like um, uh, some of the scientists that were involved in this project. It is that, but then it, it, he goes off to uh, essentially play the role of booster again. So again, is this just more evidence that he's sort of rolling with the times this is whatever he'll do he'll sort of say and do whatever it is to to get to the the into the headlines uh into the limelight or is there I'm some wondering. genuine concern that he has about what nuclear weapons could mean for for humanity for warfare for so he certainly understands that the weapons were um were very destructive were were, were very deadly uh although he didn't agree that radiation was the issue. He really thought that the bomb, its its main effect, and initially, he really believed that the main killing effect was the, the force of the bomb, the fires, the, the blast of the bomb, not the radiation. Um, later though, um, scientists began to help him understand that radiation was a bit of a problem. He created a, a big furor about the notion of a cobalt bomb, uh, the, the notion that if you encased a bomb in cobalt, that the process of explosion would create radioactive fallout that would spread over the earth and be deadly to the entire earth. So he began to understand that, but then he still, he still um, really soft pedaled radiation at other times. So I think he really was not really clear in his own mind what he really thought. That's the um, the insight that uh, Leo Slizard, I can't pronounce his name, but yeah, right, yeah. yeah there's some concerning the hydrogen bomb that it might actually, he says he, you have this quite sort of chilling moment where you describe how he's explaining to scientists that this could literally destroy all life on the planet. Um, he, and I think I think the fact the fact that it was Zillard who was telling him that is what gave it currency for him. Yeah, he gave yeah. he, he, that was part of the crowd that Lawrence really, really, really bonded to. This is maybe going to sound um, like a repetition of the last question, but again, it, it's 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 such a disturbing story. Um, he's a disturbing character. Uh, you you note that he goes back to the South Pacific in fifty six the H-bomb detonation. Um, and and this is a, the same site, right, where they had detonated an atomic bomb. And they had, in the wake of the earlier detonation, put up a little sign in a grove, called it the Lawrence Memorial Grove. And when he goes back to the site, um, there's a warning or some kind of I forget now the detail, but but basically telling people this is a radioactive site, you can't be here. Yeah, don't eat the fruit. And then he goes off to, um, after a little bit more sort of flip-flopping, to write the Hell Bomb book, which is all sort of boosting the, the prospects of a H-bomb, right? Um, even as this is, you know, late 50s, so this is the the, the birth of SANE and, other, and the sort of anti-nuclear movement, or the sort of resurgence, I guess. Um, so again, just no no sense of of conscience about this or wariness or fear right but i also think part of it is and i alluded to this at the end of my comments he really believed in science as a force for good that he couldn't he had a hard time imagining science being a problem 
Um, and I think that when he even came to something like the bomb, uh, he, he had seen its power himself. He saw it the, the night that Trinity was exploded. He screamed in terror at the, at the, at the bomb then. Uh, even though later on, when uh, you saw the picture of him at, at Crossroads, he was wearing you know, a Hawaiian shirt and flip-flops. But the night of Trinity, he was terrified from that bomb. So he, he, a part of him under, understood that, but his deep understanding about science, his, his sort of ideological belief about science is that science is a good thing. And the more we understand science and accept science, it'll be good for us. And I think he just had difficulty believing that something as powerful, profound, and in its own way pure as an atomic explosion could be bad. So two um, sort of related questions uh, on this, um, and you can take them you know, one at a time, but um, throughout the book, you know, despite the fact that his reputation more or less kind of seems to grow and grow and grow until it sort of craters, um, uh, journalists and scientists are critiquing him. Um, they are pointing out some of the things that you've mentioned already, plagiarism, the misrepresentation of, of what happens at these detonations, other things. Um, but those critiques seem to have no purchase, uh, no bite. Um, they don't dent his um, reputation all that much. Um, is that because there's just too much riding on this uh, dominant narrative in terms of what it means for people's career, what it means for their beliefs in things like science, what it means for uh, belief in the Cold War? That's that's what I would say. I, I'd say it's even more practical than that. Well, how did Tucker Carlson maintain his position as long as he did, despite despite the the concerns that were raised about him from all angles? It was because he brought in big audiences, yeah. and and that served the economic needs of his of, of his employer. Uh, Lawrence did the same thing. He brought in the the 1950s equivalent of eyeballs uh, and likes um, to the New York Times. Um, he was he was very famous, um, and the outside activities that he did, as troubling as they were, brought more publicity to the Times. Um, so, yeah, I believe it was they 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 put up with him because they saw it was a net plus for the Times. And it was only at the end when, when it, they began to see that there might really be a major problem that he was, he was not providing all the news that's fit to print, uh, that he was not providing truth, whatever truth is, but in their view, they were not, he was not providing the truth that it was risky. So he became risky and that's why they jettisoned him. Well, and you also say that um, at one point that it seemed to be the displeasure they had at him going to moonlight with other publications, um, uh, breaking stories with other in other venues. Um, that was seemingly a, the way I read it, a bigger problem for the folks at the times. Yes, that was certainly a problem. There was a, there was a sense at times that he was just kind of phoning it into the times, that he was keeping his um, <clears throat> relationship with them, but not giving the times and the times readers full benefit of, of what he's finding out and his expertise. Um, and that annoyed them and frustrated them. Um, it, was, it would do the same to me as an editor if I had somebody on my staff and their best work was appearing elsewhere that would be a problem. Uh, so, but that had happened over a period of years. It, it accumulated, it got worse. Lawrence doubled down on it from time to time when they wouldn't give him a raise that he wanted or whatever. Um, it really, the, this whole thing with the, really what brought it to a head was the, um, 
the controversy with the um, the World's Fair, where he just not not only was he writing for the competition, but he was using the Times to promote a particular public project. And the Times was very careful that it didn't want to be used in that way. Um, and the fact that he did it secretly and sort of snuck it into the paper, both shows his, uh, his chutzpah, but it also shows how upset they got about it. Well, yeah, I, I have a question about that actually. Um, sort of occurs to me, I was thinking about this um, when I was reading. Uh, yeah, how much of that is, um, her, because you're kind of painting a sort of structural story, which I find persuasive, but you know, how much of it was about personality? I mean, um, or maybe some sort of shift in the in the climate at that time. I mean, you know, uh, John Oakes, uh, who's what, Salzburger's brother-in-law, right? Who's the head of the, I'm not sure his position at the time to this, at this point, this is in the 64, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, he's the one that fires Lawrence uh, or is, driving Salzberger to dismiss Lawrence, right? Yeah. Um, and yet his predecessor, who was, uh, what, not, 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 uh, I'm forgetting the name of the, his predecessor, but his predecessor doesn't do that when, when, as you know, there are these infractions earlier on. Right. So it, it, what had, you know, I mean, you said just a minute ago that it was just the different nature of, of the Moses story. Uh, um, is it is it just is it is there no sort of role in terms of the personality that's in charge of the times? Is it had the had the had his sort of uh, bloom sort of worn off with the nuclear uh, uh, question kind of shifting in that period? Um, right. Well, when you're talking about personalities, he had shifted. He had, he had, cha he had changed supervisors. He had been a re news reporter, and most of the writing infractions had happened while he was a news reporter. And then in 1957, if I re if my memory is correct, the editorial writer on science passed away, and they thought this is the perfect opportunity to solve their problem, take him off news writing, put him on editorial writing. But that gave him a different supervisor, a different set of routines, different set of deadlines. and he immediately uh, made everybody mad. And the, they thought they'd been so smart, they'd found a, a setup that would solve their problems. They could keep Lawrence, they could keep his reputation, um, and they wouldn't have these uh, newspaper article problems that they've been having. But instead, he's, he's as, as much a pain in the neck as ever before. And so, um, and it's a new supervisor who had a whole lot less tolerance for him, I think. Than, than the previous person. Um, so it created a, a much less resilient environment for this New York, uh, the, the uh, World's Fair crisis. Um, one of the things that, that is kind of, kind of just, just stupefying um, um, is you, you know at some point, I forget if it's towards the end of the book or earlier, that even though he, he collects two Pulitzers, right? Um, you know, he's he's Mr. Big Shot with all this stuff. Um, he doesn't take pleasure in it. And he, he feels, I guess, consistently, or at least towards the end of his career, that he's a failure in a sense. Um, and you say, because he wanted to be known as a reporter, if I if I remember correctly, and and so this implication there is that he didn't feel that he was taken seriously as a reporter. Or can you elaborate on that? Yes, I think he he as important as he was, and as much of a, a force in the industry that he was, um, he felt that he didn't have the influence that he deserved. Uh, he was smarter than people were giving him credit for. He should be more influential than he was. Um, and it's not, I don't get any sense that he thought that it was his fault. You know, he hadn't worked hard enough. I mean, somebody might say, well, if I'd only worked harder or done more stories or something, it, that's not the vibe you get from him. From the vibe you get from him is those people, they don't appreciate me. Um, 
And um, so, but I also wonder if he ever could have gotten enough, if he ever could have gotten enough fame or fortune or importance. Um, because, because he, 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 he is, he's impressed with himself. He's incredibly impressed with himself for good reason. He was a smart man, but he wanted to be not just a smart man. He wanted to be the smartest man in the room. I'm curious. And known, and known for that. Yeah. I'm curious how much his, I mean, you, you know, uh, I'm curious actually, you know, what's, what sort of pulls him to science in the first place actually. But uh, my question was gonna be, you know, I imagine a person who is surrounding himself with men like uh, Einstein, Right, he meets Enrico Fermi. Right, he meets Niels Bohr. He's, yes. he's surrounded by these giants of of science. Right, yes. it's all the towering figures in, in physics at the time. Right, which is at its heyday. Um, and I can imagine, um, maybe particularly someone who who doesn't manage to get that degree from Harvard um, and is a striver, as you describe. Um, could feel a little, uh, have a bit of an inferiority complex about his, about his intellect that maybe also translates paradoxically enough into a sense of wanting to be taken more seriously. Because after all, look, look at my friends. These are, these are the great minds of, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, is, is that part of it at all? Yeah, I'm sort of got lost in my own sort of thought there, but. No, I, I think you've, you've touched on something that's quite plausible. You asked how he got in, interested in science. He got interested in science through his interest in philosophy. He was a, he was a deep thinker. And in Lithuania, um, he, uh, he, 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 he did reading in philosophy and actually did a little bit of reading in science. And that whetted his appetite for all this. Um, and back then, um, physics was actually, in some ways, a branch of philosophy. They were trying to trying to figure out yeah. what the nature of the universe, the nature of. So for him, it was a, it, it was those two things were sides of the same the same thing. Um, I think Lawrence really enjoyed being having contact with these scientists, being at the New York Times. He had access to them in a way that you or I would have a hard time getting. Um, they, he would go, he would talk to them. Um, he would, you know, he, he was friends with, with Einstein, for example. Um, and he valued that very much. Um, but you get this sense that he wishes he could do more and he tried to do more. One, one of the things, one of the sad, one of the other sad things about the end of his, of his life, was he had had a long time interest in cancer and ways to fight cancer, um, and he had a he had his own little homegrown theory about the uh, chemical biotin, which is a, a vitamin that maybe some some on this call are taking. Lawrence had this involved theory uh, that he'd come up on his own about how biotin could be a cure all for cancer. And when he was retired out in Majorca, Spain, he wrote it up and he was trying to get it published and he couldn't get it published in any scientific journal. He finally got it published in a Spanish language journal. And as far as I can tell, nobody's ever cited it or used it. But his friends among scientists were saying, Bill, don't do this. You're gonna embarrass yourself. This is not a good journal article. But it was so important for him to not just observe science, but to try to be part of science. Well, I mean, that's one of the more, you know, frightening parts of, of the story is you have several chapters where you talk about some of the other things that we're not talking about this evening, the the the, the cortisone story and 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 um these other things where Lawrence, quite apart from the scientific consensus, is picking horses. Scientists out there who he thinks uh, are going to make it, 
either in some economic or or more sort of broadly sort of beneficial social sense with some new discovery um, and drives. I mean, you know, that that cortisone story, I believe, was the one where he he actually gets an audience with Truman and then Truman goes about right having folks, I guess the government or I, I don't know what sort of going off to Africa to try to source this material that they needed for this supposed, you know, fake, uh, you know, uh, breakthrough that they were going to, that Lawrence had convinced them was going to happen, right? Um, right. That, that again, is Lawrence being an actor on the stage rather than an observer of the stage. And, um, and he did it, unlike the Manhattan Project, where he had sanction from his editors, he did the cortisone thing without telling his editors. But it show, shows the sign of his influence that he was able to get into C. Truman. You or I tried to get into C. Biden, probably wouldn't happen. But it Lawrence, that's, but you know, Lawrence is Lawrence checked in and they they got him in uh, for a few minutes, but they got him into see him. So it shows how important he was. But it also shows how he had lost his way, I think, as a journalist. But he never was a journalist. That's the thing. You were. I, as a journalist or as a former journalist, would recognize that that was improper because I'd been socialized to the ways of being a journalist. He evidently was never socialized to that. Yeah. It's a very disturbing story. Um, I want to remind people we're at the QA portion. I want to remind people to use the QA icon at the bottom of the screen to uh, submit questions. We cannot see the hand raising uh, icon. So that's how you'll you'll reach us. Um, the first question comes in from Francie, who of course uh, wants to know more about the relationship with Oppenheimer. You said that he, they knew each other. She asks, did he also did he also report on Oppenheimer? Yes, he did. Um, he um, I, I can't I'm sure Oppenheimer shows up in his atom bomb package, but but Lawrence had uh, since the 30s, Lawrence had been writing about, um, developments in atomic science by all the all the uh, characters on in the play of atomic science, including Oppenheimer. So they knew each other. Um, when he was doing his time with the Manhattan Project, and he, he traveled around, Lawrence got to travel all around the country. M many people don't realize how huge the Manhattan Project's footprint in this country was. It was in many places around this country. Uh, Lawrence got to travel to see many of them, including uh, Los Alamos. He he caused a bit of a a bit of ruckus when he showed up, because I guess nobody had told the scientists that Lawrence had been keyed in, had been brought into the project, and but they all knew who he was because they were scientists, and he he probably interviewed many of them. So he walked into an event, and they all freaked out because how did this how did this journalist get in? But they, but many of them spent a lot of time with him, including Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer, um, he told he tells a story about how Oppenheimer uh, showed him a vial of tritium, uh, and tritium is a an isotope of hydrogen that's important in atomic weapons, um, and took a little vial of it out to show Lawrence. So they spent time together and they talked a lot about what was going on. And do we have a sense for um, how Oppenheimer or any of those folks in the circle, uh, including even Eisenhower, who's not at Los Alamos, but you know, any of these folks see him? I mean, in terms of the Manhattan Project, I imagine they imagine him as just useful. Um, but I mean, uh, again, you you sort of note at different times in the book that um, uh, scientists are skeptical of him. Um, Yes, but I, my sense of the um, of the people, particularly at in the Manhattan Project, that they were generally quite fond of Lawrence and quite positive toward him. Lawrence was a nice guy. He was very ingratiating. He had a way of uh, he had a very friendly air, and probably also was I would suspect was um, somewhat subservient to scientists. I think he he respected them a lot, and he probably showed that respect in a way that um, stroked some scientific egos. So they, they all liked him a lot. If you talked, uh, if, you, if you read interviews with people, for example, who are at Trinity, um, and any the people who mentioned Lawrence always mention him 
uh, quite favorably. So I think he he made a good impression on them. Yeah, but I mean, they, yeah, all the accounts that I can remember from the book describe him as warm and friendly, and again, right. as you say, sort of charming in his way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, those are not things that are uncommon in hucksters. Um, Another question comes in about the relationship with Byron Price and the US Office of Censorship. Um, as I remember it, um, uh, Groves boasts that they barely had to do any censoring at all during the uh, during the war. Uh, um, and Price also appears in your story. Do you want to elaborate? So, um, yes, so the, we're obviously we're talking about Lawrence, but Lawrence is part of a whole ecosystem, right? A whole social system. And journalists in general during World War II, in general, I mean, there are exceptions, but in general, uh, they were all on the team. Uh, you have to recall that this was total war. This is war, this was understood as being war to save the existence of the United States and its allies. Um, and perhaps we're, perhaps that doesn't seem so touching now because we've lived under the nuclear threat for so long. Maybe we've gotten adjusted to that sort of notion. But World War II was really seen as everybody's got to be on the team here. And so that's why, for example, Lawrence and the other journalists could do the work for the Surgeon General that I talked about uh, because the Army needed it. And we have a skill that we can use. Um, it's why Lawrence could be on the Manhattan Project. It was it was for the good. It was for the end of the war, positive end of the war. And it's why virtually every organization and every journalist voluntarily went along with censorship. The government didn't have to really censor anybody. They would put out. Um, guidelines about what you could write about, what you couldn't write about. And it, it everybody went along basically because they all wanted to be on the team. Um, now, perhaps it's hard to say at this remove how much of that was a genuine feeling of patriotism, how much of it was a calculation of the political cost that there would be to oppose it, but the actions are what matter in some sense and everybody went along. Uh, Lawrence, for example, wrote, was constantly trying to write stories about the Germans and what the Germans had in atomic technology and why the United States should be doing more about atomic technology. And he was constantly being shut down by the censorship office. So he would propose an article and they would say, no, you can't write about that. Or there'd be a guideline saying, no, you can't write about that. And it was driving Lawrence crazy, but he and the Times went along with it. It was upsetting him so much that um, his managers actually were afraid that um, he was getting to a breaking point, that it would become a crisis for him, but it never did. And when he went to work for the Manhattan Project, as far as I can tell, I, you know, I've looked at what Lawrence wrote, his drafts edited by Groves. Um, I can't tell of any time that Lawrence was trying to do put information in that was secret that he wasn't allowed to put in. It sound it seems like he didn't fight that at all. So even when he was on the inside, he wasn't pushing the limits uh, on what could be said because it was understood this was what we needed to win. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, you also had an interesting aside where. Um, um, J. Edgar Hoover in the 50s investigates him at, at, at some point, right? Because um, same sort of notion that like his reporting might actually help the other side. Um, and it does, as you say, like his reporting interests the KGB so much that they start watching him. Right. What's interesting about that incident is it's so atypical of Lawrence. I said earlier that Lawrence really had lazy journalism. He wasn't doing a lot of penetrating journalism about yeah. what was going on in atomic technology. And then all of a sudden, he comes out with this article saying that the the uh, hydrogen, the, the latest hydrogen bomb had a, a different design to it, that it didn't incorporate liquid helium. It incorporated 
a, a solid substance that had helium embedded in it. Um, and this had all sorts of operational benefits because you, liquid helium, you have to keep cold, solid thing, you don't have to keep, so you don't have to keep cold. So there are operational benefits and cost benefits. Um, but out of the blue, Lawrence writes this. And you're right, it, it, it got a lot, caught a lot of attention, triggered an FBI investigation. They couldn't, they couldn't prove that Lawrence, that anybody leaked it to him. They couldn't prove it. And so they felt they had just, just had to let it go. They, they figured he could make a credible argument that he figured it out on his own, which is kind of nonsense. But, but they were making you know, a legal judgment about whether it was prosecutable. Or not. Um, but, but, what's, but, but it is so out of character for him. He wasn't writing those kinds of stories all along. All of a sudden he did it, um, which suggests that somebody was, somebody did leak him the information for their own political ends. Um, Daniel Atha writes, uh, you said that Lawrence egotistically influenced others by writing biased stories and republishing press releases, but wasn't it the Times that put his stories on the front page? Shouldn't we conclude that it was actually the Times and the government driving the agenda and using Lawrence as a tool? Well, certainly, certainly they all had a role in it, right? Uh, you're right. The, the, he couldn't have gotten on the front page without the collaboration of editors and other people at the Times and without the government to provide him the information that's there. That's absolutely true. Um, however, you look at other reporters, even other reporters at the Times who were covering atomic issues, like Hanson Baldwin, um, they were covering it in a much more measured way, a less, less hypey way. Um, in fact, Baldwin and Lawrence created an issue for their editors because they were their articles were so different in tone at times, um, they felt they couldn't run them in the same issue of the newspaper because it would confuse the readers. So there was something, there was something I think different about Lawrence's writing, his approach, his reporting, um, that he certainly has to own a fair share of the of the responsibility for what was going into the Times. Yeah, I mean, that article that you read from in your slide um, uh, gives a taste of it, but the book gives a lot more, just this, this constant need to put everything in superlatives and uh, to describe everything in the most overhyped extreme fashion, right? Um, it, 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 um, I, you know, <laughs> it, uh, it speaks to a, a rather sort of transparent to my mind, a rather transparent, um, uh, display of, of, of exactly the personality you're describing, right? Um, and one that I would sh assume the, the learned scientists would, un would look askance at. So you asked earlier. You asked earlier about his early history and how it affected his reporting. One, this is this is one area in which we see that he had a he had a long interest in being a dramatist uh, and being a playwright. Hmm. Um, he had um, he uh, actually when he was at Harvard, he took a class in playwriting, uh, and when he was working at the New York World, he was. Um, translating plays from Russian into English. Um, he had a real flair for the dramatic. And in writing, that's not a bad thing. Uh, you know, uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to say all writing should be boring and, and gray, uh, but it was very much his interest. I mean, he, he remained a member of the of the uh, of the dramatist guild until he died, hmm. because he had a real Flair, a real interest in the dramatic. Yeah, well, there's that great part where you talk about um, he scripts this uh, speech for Truman, where, I mean, the language is just, you know, it's, 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 it's yeah. What was know, he? What was he thinking? Yeah, it's it's you know I, I can't recall the the you know it's it's so saccharine it's you know. 
something along the order of, you know, like Prometheus stealing the power of the universe, we have, you know, unlocked the, you know, and it's just, and, and then Truman's like, no, we're not going to do that. That's, that's. It's not, not presidential. presidential. Yes, yeah. exactly yeah. right. Um, uh, another uh, viewer asks, uh, it was said that he didn't realize the seriousness of radiation uh, and thought that the bomb's effects were chiefly about the force of the explosion. When did he gather awareness of the lethal nature, nature of radiation? Or how? I'm not sure he ever really did. Um, I th he really, until the end, uh, really downplayed the importance of radiation or the significance of radiation in um, in everything in in the immediate um, the immediate effects of the bomb and the long lived effects. Uh, he helped. I mean, this was a question in the United States even. In the in the first weeks after Hiroshima, because news reports were coming out of Hiroshima, saying people here have all these weird the Australian journalists, yeah, yeah, um, and back in the U.S., the the administration was saying no, 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 that's not radiation. That's that's you know that's that's propaganda that's coming out, and Groves called journalists to the Trinity site, the site where just a few months earlier that bomb had gone off, which I showed you the picture of. And Lawrence was there with them. And they were all walking around trying to show that, oh, it's, you know, nothing. There's no radiation here. Nothing nothing to see here. But Move not on. smart enough to to hide the, like, I mean, they're wearing like, what, plastic wrapped around their- That's right. They're wearing covering booties. Covering on their shoes, right? Because of the radiation. So they're- Right, right. The, no, the, the pictures tell the, really tell the story. Yeah. But, but the point was, Lawrence, Lawrence was in on that. Uh, yeah. But I mean, he, he does. So, I mean, he goes back to that site um, in the South Pacific, right? Yep. Where the, the, the grove named after him has become ready. And then, and then like a couple of years later, right? He's, 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 he works on that documentary, the patterns of survival or whatever. Right. None of that is, is about, uh, radiation. He's kind of just compartmentalizing it. Did the the, the... right? So pa so patterns of survival is a, a civil defense. We would call it video movie it was, uh, that that he worked on. And really, the, the radiation doesn't play very much in that in that film. They really don't mention it or deal with it. It's all about how to protect yourself from the flash how to protect yourself from the blast. But there's not this notion that you may have to stay inside for three weeks or three years or 30 years after the bomb goes off. And how are you gonna do that? Uh, it, it, there was no, no recognition of that at all. It was all very short term. It was gonna be bad, but it's gonna be short term and then you'll be able to go out. Yeah, duck and cover. Uh, yes, duck and cover, very much. Yeah. Um... Yeah, and this is the late this is the late fifties when I think at that point it was what they were the U.S. I think alone was detonating two bombs a week or something crazy like that. That's right. That's um, right. Okay, uh, Daisy H writes. Uh, uh, in retrospect, if you can address it, did voluntary self censorship on the part of the press serve the public well? Did the press miss anything important by not covering it? due to censorship? Well, that's a really broad question. Um, but I would say it's, it's at least an open question whether the secrecy of the Manhattan Project was needed. Um, we know now that um, that the, uh, the Russians hadn't even started on a bomb project essentially while we were working on it. Um, and the Germans had gone down sort of a false false trail. Um, so it's 
I mean, what's the point of keeping it secret? You don't want to tip off other the other sides that they might work on it or or catch up with you. Uh, we were so far ahead that um, that I'm not sure what the secrecy bought us, except the psychological surprise on August sixth. Um, so if you're asking the censorship, the voluntary censorship with respect to the bomb, um, I think it had political benefits to the administration, to the government, but did it benefit us as a society? Would citizens have been better off knowing and making informed decisions about this? Quite possibly. Um, you know, we, we have those kinds of debates about weapons systems in this country all the time. Uh, well, I'll 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 throw something in there just to get your response on it, iterating on this point. I mean, um, you know, I mentioned the Ellsberg story before, you know, um Ellsberg shock when he finds out that the Pentagon has had for many, many years at this point, this is 1960, um uh plans uh like a uh, number figures on what they estimated uh, would be the death rate. Um, I think quite apart from radiation, um, if there was a strike. And of course, the plan was always just to unleash the full arsenal if there was an attack. Um, and the the figure came back right away that it would be it would basically kill um, three billion people. Um, <laughs> and uh, that alone, uh, not to mention. The questions of radiation um, uh, was not something that was broadly understood, which was what, as he says, like once the statute of limitations wrote out shortly before his death, um, that was the real sort of his, the Pentagon Papers was actually not the main point of his of his what he was planning to do was leak information about the nuclear strategy, um, which never really changed, and um, that. I can't, you know, I can't imagine how that serves anybody. Um, I mean, there was some, that, you know, it's really sort of hard to, I mean, we still live with this sort of schizophrenic policy where we understand that this is literally the dimension of the first existential threat that we've created to our existence. And, uh, you know, the notion of nuclear winter that scientists figure out in the, in the mid eighties uh, that, you know, it would shortly kill all life on the planet possibly um, within six months from the debris thrown up in the air from an exchange. Um, it's crazy to think that these nuclear bombs are being tested all the time. Uh, they're getting stronger and stronger all the time. The hydrogen bomb is supposedly 500 times stronger than Nagasaki. Um, and kids in school are doing the duck and cover. There's some sense in the public that it's this is the, the gravity of this threat. And then there's a complacency. And and to the extent that journalists like Lawrence are feeding into that, for whatever reason, that's not serving us well. Right. The secrecy, I mean, the government uses, used, and one would say, argue, still uses secrecy to uh, consolidate its control over things. What people don't know about, they can't uh, raise objections to, and the government can do in secrecy frequently what it wants without any sort of oversight or control. Um, even though, again, I would say our Manhattan Project was ahead of what the other countries were doing. And in later years, the, the US kept arguing, oh, we're falling behind, we're falling behind. You know, the missile gap, right? Yeah. But not just the missile gap, but there was an atomic gap. Yeah. It turns out there was not an atomic no. gap. We've no. always been ahead. Yeah. And. Um, yeah, I but write a public, link about this in my book. Yeah. Yeah. But the public can't know that because all this all this stuff is is kept secret. Um, so um the more the more that we can open things up, the more we can have an informed debate and informed understanding and can decide for ourselves what we want to do rather than the few people who have the who are in the know. Well, that is the much wider context of the story, too, is that the 40s is this big bang moment that's really unappreciated in terms of uh, not just sort of the growth of government, but uh, specifically secret government. Um, and that culture of secrecy, secrecy only uh, metastasizes and, and I would argue never surfaces. Um, 
But in any case, uh, uh, this is a this is a wonderful book. I encourage everyone to go out and buy it. Um, I want to say congratulations again, Vincent. Thank you uh, for writing it. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I want to thank everyone who's still watching, and we will see you again come spring academic term. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. Good evening.